Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorevsky from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. This is one of my favorite weeks of the year at Explorer Classroom. We are spending the whole week leading up to World Ocean Day on June 8th, celebrating our ocean. So we are talking to ocean scientists and explorers from all over the world who have dedicated their life not only to studying the ocean, but also protecting uh, it for future generations. So really excited for this week's events. We have lots of events coming up this week. Uh, before we meet today's guest, I want to take a quick moment to share National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive so we can get a feel for where our live classrooms are joining us from today. So bear with me for a moment while the screen shares. All right, there we go. So I am here in Canada in Alora, Ontario. As I start to back out, you can see we have a strong contingent of Ontario classrooms today. We've got a classroom in Guelph, uh, another in Toronto, another in Cortez, Ontario. If we start to back up a little more, another classroom joining us in Sarnia. Uh, we've got to go out a little more to find our other classrooms. So here we go. Down in Missouri, we have a classroom joining us in Farmington. And if we head up towards British Columbia, we have another classroom joining us uh, in BC. And we have to back up a little bit more to find Jonathan today. She is joining us from Hawaii. So here we go. I've got some nice coral representing her today. And we'll zoom in a little closer on the island. All right. Now, as I end that screen share, I want to give a quick reminder to any classrooms who are tuning in via YouTube. Uh, don't forget, you can still get in on the action. There's a chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from. Send in some questions. We'll work some of those in. And any classroom, whether you're hanging out with us on camera or on YouTube, take pictures, post them to Twitter, hashtag explore classroom, tag at Nat Geo Education. We love to see classrooms in action. All right, let's shift over to the main event. I'm so excited to be joined uh, by Jonathan Giddens today. She is a deep sea research ecologist with the Fisheries Ecology Research Lab at the University of Hawaii and a coral reef ecosystem specialist with NOAA's Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. So as a fellow with National Geographic uh, with the Exploration Technology Lab, she's developing a research program to assess indicators of deep sea health which is pretty darn cool through the Deep Ocean Drop Cam program. And I'm sure we'll learn a little bit more about those awesome drop cams uh, shortly. So this program is gonna teach us about the biodiversity of the deep sea, because uh, there's a lot we don't know uh, about the deep sea. We've visited it. Sometimes we take a few quick pictures, but there's so much left to see uh, and discover. So Jonathan has a vision to create a planet in balance, sharing her passion for exploration, discovery, and our human connection with the ocean. So Jonathan, it's so awesome to have you joining us live today. We're excited to learn a little bit more about your work. And of course, the students are gonna fire away with questions when the time comes. Awesome, well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you all about the ocean, something that I love so much, very passionate about, and I'd love to be, be able to share that with you today. So um, should I just jump right into the sharing the screen and the presentation? Absolutely, let's go. Okay, so first we'll share, and we'll see if we can. All right, can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, we had it. I think you just, oh. clicked. there we go. There we go, okay. Okay, so I, today I'll talk about the deep ecology of the ocean. Um, a little bit about why I call it deep ecology, a um, bit about my love of the ocean, and then also end with a short story about how I learned to talk to sea creatures and in hopes that you can also take that lesson and learn to talk to um, anything in nature, really, I think, from this story. But So the deep ecology of the ocean. I love to study ecology because it's not a study of things, like a laundry list of things, but it's actually a study of the relationships in nature. So what's the role of the fish in the environment and how is, how is energy transformed through the system? So it's a systems approach looking at the whole picture. And so I love to investigate these relationships within the ocean. And I call it the deep ecology of the ocean, not only because I study the deep sea, but also in the sense of the deep ecology movement, meaning looking kind of below the surface instead of just looking at surface fixes, like, oh, how do we clean up the trash that we made in the ocean or something like that, but really investigating 
what drives behavior that we would um, trash our ocean and not take care of it. And so really thinking about how to reestablish our human connection to the sea that we're really a part of it and we wouldn't want to try, we wouldn't want to have um, unsustainable behaviors. So it's a it's ecology of relationships, but also a deeper understanding looking at our human human relationships and our own role with this ocean planet, really. And it's I a study of the ocean because I absolutely love the ocean. And when you take a step back, you look at our planet, and it really is an ocean planet. It covers most of the globe. You can, can't even see the land from this far out. Um, it covers, it, it um, incorporates 99% of the habitable space on this earth. So really this earth is a, we're a bunch of sea creatures. And as human beings, we live out our lives in this very thin layer, um, this very thin edge within this ocean planet. Um, but even though the ocean is so big and so vast and really is the, the life force and the our life support system on this planet. We know so very little about the ocean, especially the deep sea. Um, it's been, we know more about the, uh, about the surface of the moon and Mars than we do about our own ocean planet. And really the, the issue there is that it's, oh, first I, this is, um, before I get into the challenges of exploring the deep sea, I, recently was introduced to this map, and this is a map of our um, world. And it's not a perspective that we're used to seeing because usually we see maps made focused on the continents, on our human-centered perspective. But this one, this map is focused on the ocean. So it really shows that the ocean is one body of water, it's one system. So in the middle there is Antarctica. And then you can see how the ocean kind of is just one one big body and that the land is a very thin edge of it. So this was a really cool perspective, I thought, to serve, to really focus on how the ocean is central to our life on this planet. So we know so very little about the ocean. It's only been about 5% of it has been explored and only 15% mapped. So again, we're lagging way behind in our discoveries compared to um, space discoveries. And the issue really is that it's just such a remote environment. It is so hard to get out to these sites to be able to image them and to see them and to, to get there because we're limited. Um, this is a picture taken on a recent expedition that I just got back from in the Seychelles, which is in the Indian Ocean. And this is with Necton Mission. They're out of Oxford University. And we were on uh, over a month long expedition out there with a massive ship and tons of equipment and a huge effort with a lot of people just to get very basic information on what the ecosystems look like, what creatures are living there, what's, what's the water chemistry like. Um, we didn't have any of that information before. And we now we have a, a little bit and it takes this huge, huge ship to get just that little bit of information. And this is all in, when you think about, you know, deep time and human history, this is all very, very recent that we were able to have the technology to be able to image the deep sea. Uh, less than a hundred years ago, this is what people were using <laughs> to, to, this was the first um, undersea exploration um, technology, really. This is a picture of uh, BB and, who's a naturalist and Barton, who's an engineer, and they devised this thing they called the bathysphere, which is um, a huge metal sphere where they, and it was only about uh, five feet in diameter to be able to get inside there and to be launched over the side of a ship with a huge long cable, half a mile of cable. And this was the first time that people could get in the water and actually look with their own eyes to see what lay beneath the depths. Um, so this was less than a hundred years ago. Um, and they could just see, you know, outside of those little tiny portals, what people had never seen before of the deep ocean. And um, so photography had not advanced enough to be able to take underwater 
photos at that time. And so what they did is they had an artist named Els Bartleman on the surface of the ship and a long telephone wire and BB would peer out of his the little portal down at about a, a half a mile underwater and he would describe what he saw to the artist by this telephone up to the ship. And she would listen and she would make these drawings of the sea creatures from his description. And so this was the first time that that scientists and also the public could see the amazing creatures, the crazy adaptations that they have to deal with life in this um, cold, perpetual darkness under crushing pressures. Um, and these are the answer to that. How, how do these creatures live under there? Because the ocean was really once thought that it was just this vast open space and there was nothing down there. But really we found out that all of the landscapes that we have on land, like huge mountain ranges and deep trenches and wide plains, they, all of these things are underwater as well and they're huge. So Mount Everest, the highest peak on, um, on land would be swallowed up into the trenches in the Pacific Ocean. So it's just these huge things that we've discovered very, very recently. Um, so even though the creatures that else would um, paint and share were these scary kind of things of, of dreams and nightmares, they were also, she kind of captured the, the character of these fish. So they kind of reminded you of like a friend because <laughs> they have, their faces are very um, expressive. And so they're, through her artwork, people could also feel a connection to the deep sea. Like they could recognize characters down there and feel like it's a part of their life and a part of the planet that they live on. And around the same time, this is the first underwater um, housing to be able to take a camera underwater. Um, and this is made out of brass. And so it's very clunky and heavy, but it, they were able to take the first underwater photos and show the color of the life. This is on a coral reef in the Florida Keys. Um, so these scientists with the technology were bringing the light, the, the ocean to people so that people could see that amazing diversity of life that was going on that below the surface that we'd never been able to see before. So now fast forward to now, the um, cutting edge of ocean exploration is we're now able to image the seafloor like never before. Um, National Geographic Society Exploration Technology Lab developed the deep ocean drop cam. So now instead of a huge two ton metal sphere um, that people get into, now we have this beautiful, it's about the size of a basketball and quite light um, sphere that we can send a high definition camera down to the bottom of the ocean. Some of these are rated to full ocean depth so they could go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Um, others are often put at about 6,000 meters, which is plenty to plenty um, capable of going to most sites on the ocean. And so this is from a recent expedition. This is um, in the Azores. And it is this is a six gill shark. So it's really incredible to be able to image the seafloor and be able to see these creatures in their natural environment. Um, relatively undisturbed. The camera does have light so that we can see it, but other than that, it's an uh, uninvasive way of being able to peer into the deep sea. And so how it works is um, it's deployed over the side of a ship with a weight system and it goes, it's the camera is programmed to record for a number of hours. And then when it's done recording, it lets go of its weight and it pops up to the surface under its own buoyancy. And um, it has a flag on the top so that we can find it again. And so that's a picture of me um, on the latest expedition. And so if the drop cam is out far away and you can't see the, the flag, it has a radio beacon. And so I can tune my radio to the frequency of the drop cam and listen with that antenna. And what I'm doing there is listening for the chirp of the drop cam. So 
um, then we go pick it up. And of course, I still like to draw as well, because even though we have the video technology and be, to be able to see the creatures and image them that way, I find that drawing and keeping a journal um, really helps me to observe and see and to, to look more deeply and understand the creatures more deeply by the practice of drawing them. And so I think that we still need else's to um, balance and to complement the technology that is um, incredible these days for exploring the ocean. Um, so this is a, re uh, a little clip of the recent expedition in the Seychelles that Sky News uh, did just a little story. And this was a, a rough day and we were out, we couldn't see the drop cam from the ship. And so we had to drop down into the little boat and there I've just spotted it. So I was listening for the chirp um, and then directing the driver to get closer and closer until we could see it. So then we recover the camera and bring it on board and then bring it back to the ship. And then we can download the data and look and see what the drop cam had seen overnight. This we were deploying them overnight on this expedition. And so here, um, I was looking at some video and this is a toad fish. I had never seen one of these before. I was like, why is he walking through the water column? He, it's a fish with feet. <laughs> and I think they usually kind of walk along the bottom, but this one, probably the currents, it was up in the water column and it just looks so funny. Um, sometimes sharks would come in and bump the, the drop cam. Um, they come, they're very curious, they come very close. And this is just us deploying the drop cam at night, um, where it was the very last thing that we did for the day as, you know, as the sun was setting, then we would um, put the drop cam underwater and uh, go and let him um, collect all the data overnight and then we would get it in the morning. And so then of course you just bring everything back on board, rinse it down, download the data and get ready for the next night. So this is how we did some exploration in the Seychelles just recently. Um, so what's amazing about these drop cams is that they're so efficient and light that they've already, it just makes it so much easier to image the deep sea. So they've already been to so many places across the globe over the last few years. A lot of these sites were from Pristine Seas Expeditions with Enrique Sala. Um, you guys might know about that program. And uh, some of these are more recent. And I believe that Joe just came back rather recently from Monterey. Um, so he got to hand work with the drop cams as well. So yeah, this is uh, an amazing data set. We have over 35 terabytes of data now of the deep ocean of places that have never been seen before. And so my job as the scientist for this program is to take that video annotation and turn it into scientific information that we can provide to help uh, manage and just know the ocean. So what I particularly do is I count up all the species that we see there and I make biodiversity indices. So I turn all that video image into a number. And with that number, I can statistically compare biodiversity between sites. So we kind of weave this picture of what does biodiversity look like across the global ocean and um, as a baseline of knowledge so that we know what sites need to be protected and which are fragile. Um, and then my colleague is a geospatial analyst. And what she does is she goes for each of those sites, she's able to find um, environmental data that she matches up from to the drop cam location. So she can tell me what is the dissolved oxygen at that site? What is um, primary productivity at that site? What are measures of habitat complexity? And so all these things we think drive biodiversity, but we're not sure which are most important for um, biodiversity indicators. So then I take that information that she provides and I put it into statistical models and I'm able to, just using math, be able to 
quantify the relationships between the environment and the species there. So again, we're looking at the ecology of the ocean and how the life there is related to the environment, to the whole system. And so that's what's really exciting about our project that I love to be working on with the Exploration Technology Lab. But going back to ocean exploration, there is something, not everything can be captured in a number, um, even though those are useful to be able to compare and do the math and to use for science to inform management. But there's something about a place that's undescribable and unmeasurable. And so actually experiencing the place with all of your senses I think is really important for being able to understand that place and to share the stories there as well, because these places are just full of inspiration um, in, their, in their entirety. Instead of just looking at a piece like a measurement of biodiversity or a measurement of oxygen, but what is the whole system telling us about its history and our role and our place here on this earth? And so on this latest expedition, I was so fortunate to be able to go down in a sub and actually see what the drop cam sees. And this is a picture of Randy, excuse me, Randy, who's the, the sub pilot. So um, it's really amazing to be able to go down into the, the depths, just like um, the early explorers and be able to actually see and experience a place. Um, and so when I was on this expedition, not only did I take data and scientific information, but I also kept a field journal about the inspirations that came from these experiences. And I had a really cool experience that I think arose because I was in this reflective mood. And this is when I learned how to talk to sea creatures. So I'll just end by telling you a very short story about the day that I learned how to do this on the ship. Um, and I'll end with that before taking questions. So we were on the ship in the Seychelles on that big, huge um, orange and yellow boat that I showed you a picture of before with all that equipment and it was so busy. There were so many things going on. There was subs were being deployed, oceanographic in uh, instruments were being deployed. There were people running, uh, walking briskly <laughs> around the, the ship and it was um, a very busy day. And it was particularly exciting that day because there was a team of news broadcasters there and they had been over the course of three days, they had been live broadcasting from the depths, from the, the submersible, um, which had never been done before. So that was amazing. Um, and on the third day, they dedicated the live broadcast to uh, connecting with classrooms. And so students were able to tune in and they could ask questions of the scientists who were on the ship and, and also underwater. And I was going about my day um, up and down the stairs of the ship and I was getting the drop cam ready, very busy. And I overheard a question that a student asked. And the student asked, if you could speak with sea creatures, what would you ask them? And I stopped in my tracks and I thought, what a fantastic question. And I could tell that the scientists who were being interviewed also thought very deeply about that question. And they began to one by one tell their answers or what they would ask. And somebody said, well, I'd ask them, where do they go when we're not there? Or, you know, what do they feel? What are they feeling? And finally, it came down, it came around to my colleague. Her name is Rowana. She's an amazing scientist. And her answer really went straight to my heart. She said, you know, if I could talk to sea creatures, I would ask them, what can we do to help you? You know, humans, we have such a far reaching negative impact. We leave our trash places, we're changing the climate, we're making it very difficult for life to exist as well on this planet. We have such a far reaching negative impact. So." What can we do as humans to help you see creatures? And I loved that answer. I thought it was, it was amazing to um, ask them that question. And so I started to ask that question of myself and I thought, huh, what can we do for the sea creatures? And as I sat there pondering, the answer started to come up in me and I, 
I listened to the answers and it was, I was thinking about it. I was like, well, we kind of know that, you know, the oceans are getting warmer. And so they would probably ask us to be more careful with our, our uh, ecological footprint, with our carbon emissions and overconsumption. The oceans are getting warmer. It's getting more acidic, which is making it also from carbon emissions. And further, it's getting choked with plastic with from our um, throwing away plastics. And so they would ask us to just be more careful and live more lightly and not have such a, a large impact with our behaviors. And as these answers came up, I thought, huh, I'm actually, I asked a question and I'm getting an answer. So am I actually talking to the sea creatures? And how do I do that? How do I, how am I talking to the sea creatures? And I realized the reason why I can do it is because it's the same for us as humans. We experience the same thing. The weather is changing. It's getting warmer. Um, we see trash everywhere on the beaches. And so if we ask ourselves that question, we would have the same answer. And the reason why we have the same answer is because if we share the same earth, what happens to the sea happens to us. And so this is how I learned to talk to sea creatures because I realized that when you ask, you're actually asking our same self. It's the self that shares this earth with all other creatures. And so I, was so, I jumped up and down and I was so excited and I was running around. I said, we can, we can, we can talk to sea creatures. And then of course, my colleagues probably thought I had been at sea for too long and they just kind of let me, um, do that but i still think that we can and i think that this also would work in any place in nature that you love um you can talk to sea creatures because we share nature with the the rest of the world and it's that same self but the key is that you have to be in a contemplative mode and i think that drawing and writing and keeping a journal helps us get there and so my final thought is that if you would like to try this, I would love for you um, to keep in touch. And so I'm gonna keep sharing my experiences of being in nature and being in these, these ocean places. Um, and I would love to hear if when you're out during the summer exploring the natural world, if you have these inspirations, um, please share them with me. And I would love to hear uh, what you say and how your conversations go. Um, and also, Furthermore, there's one place that I do keep a, a blog and writing about, um, about what's happening with the deep sea exploration and that's on National Geographic's Open Explorer and the project is called Into the Deep. So that's where you can also keep checking back in and actually you can follow it and see what's going on as we explore the oceans. So, Thank you very, very much for listening to my story. And I would be really happy to take any questions that you have. All right, Jonathan. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story and uh, your recent adventures and learning from the ocean and that really important message that we are we really are affecting our, our oceans in a huge way. And they're not just important to the creatures in it, but they're crucial for our survival as well. So we do need to protect those oceans. Yeah. Um, all right, so if you hit that green button one more time, you'll come back to us on the share screen. Well, uh, before we meet some of our live classrooms, I wanna give a shout out to a few watching us online. So we do have Mrs. Uh, Cox's group joining us from Shoreline, Washington. Don't forget to send us in some questions. And then Jonathan, I think there's someone watching you might know, there's a Candace watching. Does that sound familiar? That's my aunt, yeah. hi Candace. <laughs> Very cool, so she's tuning in as well. Yay. All right, well, let's meet some of our live classrooms and start stealing their questions. So uh, where should we go first? All right, let's go to Mrs. Matthews' group hanging out in Courtney, British Columbia. Let's get that microphone turned on. Madam, can you turn the microphone on? How are we doing, British Columbia? <laughs> All right, who's got a question? In front of the camera. No, in front of the camera. Really? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Amelia. I'm in grade three at a Cow Puntland Park in Courtney, BC. Hi, nice to see you. 
what inspired your interest in deep sea biodiversity? Well, I've always loved the ocean, but growing up, I could only see, you know, the very surface of it. And only every once in a while, we lived inland in inland Massachusetts. And I got to see it for during summer vacation, maybe once or twice a year. And I always knew that the ocean, seeing the ocean was when I was most alive. I felt most one, like full of wonder and excited to be alive. And it always just drew me with the sense of awe, just seeing, looking out and seeing how vast it is. And I always wondered, you know, what's below the surface and what's further out. And so I just always had that curiosity. And then one day when I was in high school, an explorer named Bob Ballard, who you might know, he found the Titanic and our our school was so fortunate to have this visiting explorer come and he talked about his research. And I listened to him as he described the exploration that they were doing um, and what people could do to discover the deep sea and to tell its story. And I knew then that that's what I wanted to do. And because before it was just kind of like a wonder and something that I just thought about. But then Bob Ballard came and said, look, there are, you know, there are ways we can explore the, the world and the, the deep ocean. So I think it was an innate wonder, but then also seeing another explorer doing it who was kind of calling for us all to help in the effort because we need explorers, we need scientists. And so I was very happy to answer that call. <laughs> all right, very cool story. I like that Bob guy, he's got a pretty cool ship too. Yeah, he's got a cool ship. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Salisbury's group joining us in Sarnia, Ontario. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Sarnia? Yeah. All right, who's up? Okay. Go look into the camera. There you go. Go ahead. You got to look into there. Ask a question. What inspired, when you were a kid, did you want to become, uh, no, what's your, favorite? what's your favorite part of your job? Oh, there's so many different favorite parts, but I think it's, it's being near on and near the ocean and being, um, being able to work with the ocean and with ocean people. So everybody on the ship who, is also exploring everyone's curious everyone's excited um and we're kind of working together to tackle this problem of how do we how do we understand and how do we learn more um so i love being on and in the water with like-minded with people who are also curious and excited for the ocean and i also really like this i mean i love sharing the excitement and telling people about what we found and hearing questions and because that inspires me too. So I love the exploration and I love sharing it. All right, good answer. Uh, let's see, where should we go now? Um, Guelph, Ontario, grade six is hanging out with Mrs. Hug. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Guelph? Good. good. Woo. All right, you guys aren't very far away. I could be there. Actually, I was just there this morning. <laughs> how much percent of the ocean has been discovered? And have you discovered any sea creatures? Um, how much percent? Well, about the figure is about 5% has been explored and 15% mapped. So mapping we can do with kind of remote imaging. And then exploration is like actually being there to explore it. So a super, super, very tiny little bit of the ocean, not very much at all. Um, so we need more ocean explorers to help us understand it. And well, sorry, what was the other question? Oh, have I discovered any sea creatures? Not that I know of. <laughs> so there's some, there's some sea creatures that we see in the footage where I don't know what it is. And so I pass it, I ask a friend and colleague and they don't know what it is. And so we kind of, we have to use a whole network of experts really to help us under help us identify these creatures and so there are some so far that nobody knows what it is but um 
the process of actually describing a new species so that you can say, yes, this is definitely a new species. It takes a very, very long time with lots of evidence besides just the, um, the images. So we need uh, more team and more, more resources to be able to um, describe scientifically new species. But there are definitely a lot of unknowns where I look at a, a creature and I don't know what that is and nor does anybody that I know. So there's a, a lot of mysteries waiting to be found. All right, we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Mrs. Dillon's group, Farmington, Missouri. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How we doing, Missouri? My name is Samuel Figueroa. Hi. Do you know anything that the fish that live at the bottom of the ocean, do you know anything that they have in common? With each other or with us? With each other. Oh. Well, so there's a lot of different adaptations. So some deep sea fish, so it's very, it's dark down there, especially if you go very deep, there's no light at all. And so some fish will answer that question by um, getting really, really specialized eyes. And you see them with like these big bugging eyes. So they make their eye organ really, really big. And some creatures would answer that question by saying, well, I can't see at all anyway. So then they just don't use sight at all. So there are some sea creatures that kind of go along that same pathway of having um, similarities, but then there are some that are very divergent as well. So I think the commonality is mostly just having to deal with that, um, that question from the environment about how, does, how can you survive and make a living living under those deep, under uh, lots of pressure and in no light and in vast spaces? So I think the answer is a little bit of both. They're very different, but also very similar. <laughs> All right, that's a good answer. It's, uh, that's what animals do. They find their niches, they find little areas they can fit into the habitat and make it their own. So same conditions, but different solutions in a lot of cases. All right, uh, Mrs. Wong's group, grade six is hanging out in Toronto, Ontario, here in Canada. Let's get that mic on. How are we doing, Toronto? Hi, hi, hi. hey, sisters. What is your educational background? Um, well, I studied all kinds of things because I was really interested in a lot of things, but. Um, formally, uh, for when I went to college, I did marine science. This is at uh, UH Hilo, so there's a college, University of Hawaii on the Big Island. Um, so I studied marine science and anthropology because I've always been interested in people too and um, how do we relate to our natural environment. So marine science, anthropology, and then for my master's, I did a program called Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science, which is basically all encompassing for um, everything, <laughs> but um, environmental science at conservation science for master's. And then when I was uh, doing my PhD, that was um, for zoology, basically. And I was studying coral reef fish ecology at, at that point, so the, the more shallow areas of the ocean. So I've um, kind of branched out a bit and woven a, a kind of interdisciplinary um, my degree. But it all has to do with the ocean and people on the ocean. All right. And it's a good, I think, to add too that there is no right way to get into science. Everybody has different paths, different things they study. Some start studying something and end up in something totally different. So you never know uh, where a career in science can take you. Absolutely. All right. Well, Jonathan, I can't believe how fast 45 minutes can disappear. It was so awesome uh, to be able to hang out with you, hear your story, uh, have some students ask questions. I know there's definitely more questions out there. So I'm wondering if you'd be okay if maybe the classrooms, when they got off, if they had more questions, could tweet some questions at you. Absolutely. Please do keep in touch. Yes. Okay. So I think it's at Jonathan Lauren. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Twitter is at Jonathan Lauren. Instagram is at Jonathan Giddens. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Well, classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out with us today and your awesome questions uh, as per usual. 
uh, shouldn't have been surprised. Uh, and I want to give a shout out uh, to the rest of our Explore Classroom events coming up this uh, week. If you go to nationalgeographic.org and uh, search Explore Classroom, you'll find what's coming up. We might even have a camera spot or two left, or you can tune in live via YouTube. And don't forget to post some pictures for us. Uh, hashtag Explore Classroom. We love to see classrooms in action. So John, I think the last thing we'll do today is I'm gonna turn on the microphones. We'll let the classrooms get a little loud, a big goodbye and thank you. Uh, yeah. And then we'll sign off for today. Awesome, thank you for having me. All right, <laughs> microphones are coming on boys and girls. Let's get <laughs> All right. They're always so good at that and they're always ready to go. Uh, Jonathan, again, thank you so much. And we will see you in a few days. See you soon. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, everybody.